Mr. Weistad, good, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the session on uh, uh, rethinking strategies for integrated urban and regional development. We have very little time. We actually have five speakers. <clears throat> so let's do a bit of a housekeeping. Uh, you can participate by asking questions and voting on the app that you all have, I believe, on your mobile phones. So uh, the right in this and the room, if you have any questions on how to use that, you know, we, we, uh, we want to be sure that, that we address your most burning questions and issues. So this ask and vote tool uh, will allow you to submit your questions and vote up the ones that you like most. And you would be able to express your opinion by rating the session at a poll that the organizers have enabled for you. Right, uh, let us move on. Uh, my name is Paulus Kulikowskis. I'm an official of the United Nations. I'll be moderating the session. Uh, I just want to use my remaining two minutes to explain why is it necessary to rethink the strategies for urban development? You would recall that many years ago we started speaking about integrating different themes in urban development such as infrastructure, social services, housing and so on and so forth. Then we started speaking about bringing in different sectors the government, the non-governmental organizations and civil society, the private sector and so on. Then we added another layer speaking, speaking about the multiplicity of territorial scopes. The municipalities, the neighborhoods, the administrative borders of the cities, the metropolitan areas, the city regions and so forth. Uh, Lately, we have also recognized that there are many different levels of governance and that all these levels of governance, the national government, sometimes even multinational and multilateral system, and the national government and the regional government and the city governments have to cooperate if we want to achieve a good result of urban development so that it benefits all the citizens. <clears throat> So, not to repeat it to every speaker, I would ex accept of what they have already prepared for us. I would want them very much to reflect on their personal experience of crossing these many different layers and sectors. And if you have this experience, please also tell us how it helped you and the work that you were doing to improve your strategic thinking. Right, our first speaker today is uh, Mr. Jordi Pericas, who is uh, a Bachelor of Mathematics and Masters of Public Management. He is a director of uh, technology systems in Diputacio of Barcelona and also a head of the Smart Region Project. Jordi? Yeah, if you wish, you can do it from here. You see? Almost on time. Okay. You have eight minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Five seconds gone already. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make my presentation in Spanish, one of my languages, because it will be more easy for me. Buenos días, tengo ocho minutos, voy a intentar uh, cumplirlos para no acumularse uh, al final en el último ponente no poder hablar. Les voy a referir en toda mi intervención siete ítems. Estos siete ítems son los siguientes. Voy a hablar de eficiencia, voy a hablar de supramunicipalidad, voy a hablar de homogeneidad, Voy a hablar de cloud, voy a hablar de sostenibilidad, voy a hablar de compartición y finalmente voy a hablar un nombre propio de sentilo. Eficiencia, supramunicipalidad, homogeneidad, cloud, sostenibilidad, compartición y sentilo. 
para comprender un poco lo que les quiero explicar, déjenme que les hable un poco de la estructura municipal de eh, nuestro país. Hay algunos países europeos que han hecho un esfuerzo importante para reducir el número de municipios. ¿Por qué se hace esto? Porque efectivamente un excesivo número de municipios dificulta mucho la eficiencia a la hora de prestar los servicios municipales. Por tanto, ese primer ítem que les, de, los, de los cuales les hablaba la eficiencia, con una estructura de municipios tan dispar o tan numerosa, es muy difícil que cada uno de ellos pueda prestar servicios de manera eficiente. Porque además la escala en tamaño es muy divergente. En la provincia de Barcelona eh, hay un municipio con 25 habitantes, que tiene su alcalde y que tiene su ayuntamiento. Y hay otro municipio, que es la ciudad de Barcelona, que tiene un millón y medio de habitantes. Y tiene una alcaldesa y tiene su ayuntamiento. ¿Cómo se resuelve esto? Fusionando municipios. Imposible. ¿Por qué? Porque la tradición cultural impide que determinados municipios converjan en uno solo. ¿Qué alternativa tenemos ante esto? Segundo ítem importante, supramunicipalidad. Es decir, definir organizaciones supramunicipales que eh, ayuden a corregir esa ineficiencia del número elevado de municipios. Una estructura, unas estructuras supramunicipales que puedan tener carácter político, que deben tener una componente técnica muy importante, porque tienen que actuar como apoyo a los servicios de los municipios, pero sobre todo estas organizaciones supramunicipales que tienen que garantizar una prestación de servicios homogénea en todo el territorio. Es decir, con independencia del tamaño del eh, municipio, que los servicios que recibe el ciudadano, la ciudadana, sean equivalentes. Les presento la, la Diputación de Barcelona, eh, la, la provincia de Barcelona, una extensión de 7.700 eh, kilómetros cuadrados, 311 eh, municipios y una población total de 5 millones y medio. Tenemos la capital en Barcelona, un millón y medio, y en el resto de la provincia casi cuatro millones de habitantes. Pero ¿cuál es la estructura de estos municipios? Pues fíjense, solo hay 19 municipios con más de 50.000 habitantes. El resto lo ven ustedes en la, en la transparencia. Por tanto, ya ven que el mapa de los municipios de la provincia es tremendamente heterogéneo. ¿Qué hacemos en la Diputación de Barcelona? La Diputación de Barcelona es precisamente uno de estos entes supramunicipales que intenta hacer lo que les he comentado antes, es decir, garantizar la prestación de servicios de manera homogénea en todo el territorio, dando apoyo a los servicios municipales en entorno, en tratamiento de residuos, en eficiencia energética, etcétera, etcétera. Y también en servicios TIC o en servicios ICT. Y aquí es donde aparece un primer concepto importante. Estos servicios TIC los presta este órgano supramunicipal en modo cloud. Por tanto, estas organizaciones supramunicipales deben de ser el cloud privado municipal de los ayuntamientos de su uh, provincia. En el siglo XXI se observa un fenómeno dispar, es decir, hay una gran concentración en las ciudades grandes y por otra parte eh, que las hace a veces insostenibles y unos municipios pequeños que los hace ser débiles e insostenibles. Por tanto, les había comentado en uno de los ítems, ítems de hablar de sostenibilidad, pues efectivamente el panorama que se nos presenta es difícilmente sostenible a la hora efectivamente de prestar servicios de calidad para los ayuntamientos. ¿Qué nos permite la tecnología en el siglo XXI? 
y con el anuncio del cloud ya eh, les avisaba o ya eh, iniciaba lo, el recorrido que quiero hacer. La tecnología permite en el siglo XXI algo muy importante, que es compartir. Por el hecho de convergir en un punto, en una nube, nos permite compartir diferentes soluciones. De forma que lo que hasta ahora eran eh, apoyos desde la propia estructura municipal verticales, es decir, en el ámbito del tratamiento de, de los residuos, en el ámbito energético, en el ámbito de la movilidad, el hecho de convergir todos ellos tecnológicamente en un cloud nos permite eh, compartir soluciones, ahorrar costes, pero sobre todo compartir soluciones. Y finalmente, en la recta final eh, de este último minuto, solo decir que en el caso de la Diputación de Barcelona, eh, en el 2013, el Ayuntamiento de Barcelona, el Ayuntamiento de la Capital, desarrolló una plataforma tecnológica llamada Sentilo, en eh, software libre. La Diputación de Barcelona lo que hizo para aprovechar esta iniciativa de la capital fue coger esta plataforma y convertirla en una plataforma multitenan. Eso es, una plataforma que permitiese dar servicio a distintos ayuntamientos a la vez. Esto es lo que pueden ver en este modelo. De esta manera, la Diputación de Barcelona ofrece una infraestructura en la nube una infraestructura eficiente y una infraestructura que permita mejorar la calidad y la prestación de los servicios en todos y cada uno de los municipios. Muchas gracias. Bravo. Thank you very much. Our next speaker comes from far away, uh, from China, Beijing. It is Dr. Feng Bo. Uh, he is from the China Center for Urban Development, a deputy director of smart and low carbon cities, and has a lot of experience in sustainable urban development. Dr. Bo, please take. You. Hello. 来进行这个演讲，跟大家分享一下中国建设智慧城市的经验与案例。我是来自国家发改委城市和小城镇改革发展中心的冯波。我今天主要想给大家讲一讲中国的智慧城市和共享经济。大家知道，中国现在正在经历人类历史上规模最大，也是影响深度最大的城镇化进程。二零一七年，呃，城镇化率是百分之五十七点三五，生活在。城市当中的居民大约有七点九三亿人，这种八亿人生活在群众当中，这是城市当中，这是一个巨大的人口体量。从两千年开始，中国每年有大约百分之一的城镇化进程，也就意味着，以十三亿人口基数来看，我们每年有大约一千五百万的人从乡村走向城市，这是一个巨大的，呃，进程的规模。带动的也是社会里面深层次的变化，带动的是投资效率的变化，带动的是消费行为的变化，带动也是人们生活行为的一种巨大的改变。我这儿简单进行了一个统计，刚才我们前一位发言人谈到过大城市、小城市、有活力的城市、没活力的城市。中国的城市有多少个呢？中国大大小小的城市有六百五十七个，超过一千万的人口，大城市有六个，啊，五百到一千万有十个。同样，建制镇大约有两万一千多个。这个巨大的城市体系当中，我们蕴藏了十三亿人口，这是我们巨大的一个发展的一个变量。第二，中国现在发生的一个巨大的变化就是城镇间的区域在不断的缩小。我们知道，中国可以分成东部、中部和西部。东部的发展趋势在原来是明显快于中西部的，现在东部在持续保持领先的情况下，还和东中西部也在。迎头赶上，和它东部的区域是不断缩小的。我们也可以看到，为了推动这块中国进在政治体制和这个政策制定上进行了大量的改革。从二零一四年开始，中国公布了新型城镇化规划（二零一四到二零二零）。今年的十九大提出了乡村振兴战略和区域协同发展战略。在未来，中国在建设区域协同发展过程当中，要有二十个城市群，这二十个城市群当中将云集百分之七十五以上的中国的人口，可能到未来，云集的人口将达到百分之八十五
，我们可以想象。城市群内部之间可以通过基础设施的互联互通，通过智慧城市的建设，通过海绵城市的建设，来不断提高资源优化配置效率，进一步提升我们城市发展和居住的水平，也进一步达到我们今天所提到的区域一体化的重构。下面我们谈到智慧城市，我认为智慧城市是新型城镇化当中一个题中应有之意，一个很重要的内容。在二零一五年，国家发改委曾经提过，建设新型城镇化。有两个，有三个抓手，叫一荣双新。荣就是农民工要融入城市，新新型城市有两点：第一是新生中小城市培育，第二就是新型城市建设。智慧城市利用物联网、大数据、云计算建设智慧城市，信息化和城市基础设施不断的融合，是我们下一步建设中国智慧城市，也是中国经济增长一个重要抓手。在这里面呢，我不想讲太多宏观的道理，我只想和大家分享几个在中国发生的比较代表性的案例。比如说，我们今天提到的共享经济和绿色出行。共享经济最近一段时间在共中国这个大地上发展的方兴未艾，像共享汽车、共享单车、共享的充电宝、雨伞，甚至居住和众创的空间都风起云涌，引起了一个风潮。我们也知道，就拿最典型的自行车来讲。中国原来是自行车大国，有十三亿人口就有十三亿多的自行车，在某种程度上讲是中国的一个代表。同时，中国是汽车大国，汽车大国，一个是代表了汽车的市场大，另外一个汽车的也带来了交通拥堵和环境污染的问题。怎么解决呢？我们有新的办法，大家可以可以看到，我们的习总书记前两天在 APEC 会议曾经说过啊。说创新是撬动发展的第一动力。从三十年前第一封电子邮件从北京发出，到今天，中国已经有手机的用户、上网的这个居民七点五亿人，其中用手机这种移动端上网的人是七点二四亿人，这是一个巨大的体量。他们怎么来参与这个城市的治理和管理呢？可以通过共享汽车、滴滴打车和共享单车，比如说这个网约车。已经有四亿用户，四亿用户减少的这个私家车上路就是三十五万辆，减少的二氧化碳排放量就是一百四十三万吨，可以减少我们每年的这个这个小汽车呀，大约九十一万辆的上路。这是这这个我们的共享单车，减提供了交通最后一公里的便利，也达到了这个挤掉黑车的这个目的，减少了这这个自行车丢失的这个困扰。这个过程当中，我们又注意到这种新的竞争也是激烈存在的。首先，这些像这个摩拜、OFO 这种小的这种新型的这种经济体，有押金，它是一种金融的功能。第二，可以跟我们的市民的信用挂钩。同时呢，由于这个自行车作为新生事物，也造成了这个乱停乱放和城市视觉污染的一些新的问题。如何解决？我们想主要是几点。第一个，我们可以用政府通过 P to P 购买的方式来解决问题。政府搭平台，需要市场性做的，市场的自然会提供相应的机会来解决。同时，居民要参与，每个人都是发现智慧的眼睛。只有让大家参与这个事情，大这个共享经济才能做得更好。在这个过程当中，我们。这个和华为公司和软通动力公司一起研发了这个城市控制终端的产品，今年也在砥砺奋进的五年大型成就展上有展出。我呢就用一个案例，一段小的视频给大家来展示一下。在城市当中的人，无疑要在这里面占据一个支配者的角色。想象他就是我们生活在城市当中的人，可以通过手机来操控这个城市。我们发现了共享单车，就是我今天话题的里面的主题。它不是我的，它是代表大家的。但是我们如果要遇到这些乱停乱放问题，我们只需拿手机一键拍照，上传到我们的城市控制中心，因为有它的实名，因为有图有真相。很快的，城市管理部门就会把它交给到城管，我们的城管部门马上就会把它解决掉
，因为这个这个片子还很长啊，因为咱今天时间有限，我只能给大家放前面四分之一，最最后的四十秒钟我给大家小结一下，建设新型智慧城市。建设共享经济，我认为应该政府引导，首先发挥政府的作用，让政府发挥主导作用，市场来引政府来引导，市场来主导。第二，政府投入的短板，让市场的资源配置方式来自动的解决。第三，我们要拥抱新技术，带充分发挥互联网带来共享经济的机会。我们对于新增事物要充分的包容。给他更多的机会来试错和容错。最后，我们要更加的关注需求变化带来的各种技术创新，让我们拥抱变化，拥抱新的世界。谢谢大家。Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bo. Our next speaker is Mr. Wolfgang Foltz from Bosch.、Uh, I don't need to introduce、uh, Bosch Company, I'm sure. The floor is yours. So, thank you very much. I'm a project manager there at Bosch,、uh, dealing with various projects worldwide, and th that's even a part of my presentation to show what is our、um, process to re rethink strategies and even do the integrated development for smart cities. So. We are driven as a technology company from various megatrends. On the one hand, the demography, urbanization, energy, and the connectivity. And the connectivity、um, drives us to rethink even our strategy that the products we are delivering in those four business sectors, as mobility solution, industrial technology, energy building technology, and consumer goods, has to be connected. We have to bring in this connectivity, and therefore, we are offering even. A Bosch software platform and a Bosch cloud, maybe all where we collect all the data being created,、uh, analyze this, monitor this, and from this we get you new services and new applications. That's our process,、uh, how we deal with this in, in general within our products. Now coming to the title of this session, now it's about rethinking strategies and what is. Um, the process and the task,、uh, what we do within Bosch. So let me start with this picture, and I ask you, what what do you see? What do you see? I see somewhere someone sitting on a luggage rack. It could be in a train, but he observes the situation. What is going on around him? And that's something what we do even in those projects for smart cities. And we follow there a process, which is a design thinking process, that we fully understand the stakeholders being involved、um, to meet the user needs. And finally, sure, we are a company. We have some business、uh, goals behind. To 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 get the business success finally. This picture shows the three pillars within the process we are building on. On the one hand,、uh, we have to understand the user.、Uh, we have to know which solution、uh, is feasible, and finally, sure, it has to be a sustainable sustainable solution we want to bring in. We have to think about the business, the business models,、uh, which relates to this solution. So it's not just about one person and one user. We have to think of the customer journey. How is someone using a solution? And I've brought one example with me. This is an example what we did together with the mayor, with the city of Ludwigsburg,、uh, that we were approached by the mayor、uh, some years ago, and he was asking us, "You, what, boss? What can you do as a technology company?" To help us as a city to solve our problems, we want to know something about your cutting-edge technologies you have currently on the roadmap, and we want to be open to you and share with you our pain points which we have. And then we, we we had a lot of discussions, and finally,、uh, what we did there, we we started to have a living lab, which means that Bosch can get. There into the city, showcase, test, develop the new solutions in the context of smart cities. We use this for MVPs, minimal viable products, solutions to test them and finally to scale them. This is a very productive approach,、um, with, which is very much dealing with new strategies, with new so- approach to get to new solutions within the smart city context. So the next thing is, how do we get from those strategies to the integrated development? And、um, 
Sure, we are a big company. We have various solutions in those segments, energy, buildings, mobility, governance, safety and security. I don't want to go through all of them. I don't have the time to do this. But important to mention, because it's about integrated development, uh, that we, the, those behind those segments, we have building blocks. And the key there is that you have to combine them to maximize the customer benefit. One example would be, for example, we have the intermodal transport solution and we have a solution which is connecting parking spots. So what we do in Stuttgart is we give this information to the commuters um, which travel in the morning uh, to, um, to the city uh, that they know there is a congestion ahead, for example, and that they informed about the free parking spots, that they change the mode of mobility, park their car, take the public transport, and be even much faster in the city center. And that's something about the combination of the parking and the intermodal transport. Another solution uh, I want to show to you, and it's there even mentioned from the German Environment Agency I'm referring to, it's about a solution which we call COOP. And um, it's about an electrical driven scooter. It's about easy battery recharging, interconnection of scooter and app, which we bring in. And it's about a new business, an operation model, which we do there in the city, for example, in Berlin and also in Paris. It's, um, we started this last year, and it's a similar way running as conventional bike or car sharing services. And it's, as we just heard in the previous talk, a very important new business model, uh, which we even support the cities, the traffic, the mobility within the cities to reduce the emissions, to reduce traffic and congestions. Um, and that's a really great solution uh, for the cities in the future. So this, these are or this is an example of such kind of building block, but we're doing this even then for cities or communities. There is one example in Germany, uh, it's uh, Esslingen in the, in the Stuttgart region, where we supported the developer, which was following the goal to develop the city as a CO2 neutral city. And at the beginning, the developer even was not knowing what does it mean for the technologies, which solutions does he need. And uh, it's about 500 new homes being built there. And then we supported him from the very beginning on the analysis to the conception uh, through the, the technical planning and the realization, the first homes uh, being built there. The people will move in in January 2018. And the solutions we will bring in is uh, connected uh, household appliances, it's uh, CHP combining heat and power production and even the mobility is being involved because there will be um, electrical vehicle fleet. Um, this will be like a permanent fleet, permanent fleet within the resi for, for the residential people um, that you combine the electrical vehicles in the overall uh, energy management. So the last example is in San Francisco. Uh, it's a little bit larger. There's about 12,000 new homes and uh, it's uh, a new city district 10 kilometers away from the city center and again here it's about a climate friendly district and we also bring in here for example a smart community app um, the city platform linking all the data together giving the data to the citizens and to the uh, to the administration or the operational people the security infrastructure is being introduced and so on these are two examples with the integrated approach for example here we're combining security mobility energy topics together and we maximize the benefit for the customer and for the citizens so thank you very much um, some examples, um, I had to make it short, but you're welcome to visit us at the booth uh, and we can follow the discussion even after the discussion we will have here in the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Foltz. Uh, okay, we'll move continents again. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Kostli Chanza, who comes from the Blantyre City Council in Malawi. He is the Director of Town Planning and Estate Services. Uh, Mr. Chanza, the floor is yours. 
as well as eight minutes of time. <laughs> uh, thank you. My presentation will be on integrating low-cost GIS uh, and remote sensing in urban planning in developing countries. We are aware that uh, in most developing countries, one of the biggest problems that city councils are facing is to manage data. Now, with the coming of GIS, it has also created another problem because most of them cannot afford to procure data sets or to procure softwares. Now, my presentation will basically dwell on how best these city councils can still continue to prepare their data sets and move on with life by using low-cost softwares as well as remote sensing. Uh, this is a map of my country. Malawi is located in the southern part of Africa. So Blanda is one of the cities in the region. Um, my presentation basically will go towards making Blanta a city slightly smarter than it is now. Um, when talking about geographic information systems as GIS, we normally think of about five components, which includes people, data analysis, hardware, and software. Now, these things they need to come up into a function where GIS will be like a centerpiece, and then you store, do querying, analyzing, displaying, and capturing information to and from the GIS system. Now, using low-cost GIS, because right now, most people, if you just go outside, there's, I think, one cubic core there uh, by ArcGIS, and I suppose maybe as is also around here. They produce softwares that are not easily accessible by most developing countries. Now, for them to buy those software, they need to acquire a lot of resources. Now, what do we do? These city councils have to use low-cost GIS like quantum GIS, but they can also use maybe earlier versions of um, ESRI softwares like ArcView. Now, on the other hand, they have also to use, look at um, satellite images from the internet, which are free. Then you do the georeferencing. And then after you've done the georeferencing, you do the digitization of the structure that they found respecting uh, in their existing situations. Once this has been done, they have to do some training to the local staff to ensure that they are hands-on on this software and also maybe buy low-cost hardware system. Once all this is done after collecting field information with, with 100 GPSs, at the end of the day, then they should come up with a land use mapping which can use these softwares. So using land use mapping, they can now come up with a decision. It will be like a decision support tool for these city councils. So you look at this particular map, there's a land use map or urban structure plan, and then you've got another geographical map on the right there. So, or topographic map. You can also move on to come up with a, uh, other activities within the council, like uh, street naming exercises, or physical dressing exercises, or maybe collecting information on land parcels in the city using the same information, the satellite images, and also the low-cost um, low uh, softwares. So in that case, you can come up with decisions on development control, physical addressing, but also maybe urban sprawl, especially in informal settlements, where it is difficult to make a decision as far as planning is concerned. So using this low cost, you can still come up with uh, information about how many areas of the city are being sprawled upon or how many people are living in informal settlements. But there are also other activities that can also utilize the same systems, like preparing the land use, I've said that already, urban sprawl, land suitability analysis, infrastructure planning, solid waste management, development control compliance, disaster mitigation. And also, after we have done this, you can also do the interfacing with the expert system to come up with a mapping that can support decisions. I've talked about development control compliance, road infrastructure, um, like, uh, site suitability, whether an area is hilly, you come up with a contour mapping and then you see the particular piece of land that is suitable for urban development. Now you can do the interfacing we're using uh, also uh, softwares within that are easily accessible, like uh, access. You can come up with a you can integrate access with the GIS to come up with this phase where people can actually enter information on land management. Now, whilst this is the case, there are also some constraints that may have to come up. Like uh, most developing countries may not have appropriate base maps to collect this information. But there's also another challenge of correlating remote sense data and cadastral information. Some areas may not be accessible 
for security reasons. There could also be ined inadequate funding to get hardware, lack of maintenance, data sharing from institutions. Some people may not be ready to, data, to share data with other institutions, but also high staff turnover. Once we develop them, we train them, they can also move into other institutions. So this could be a challenge that the city councils have to look forward to, over and above coming up with this low-cost GI setup. Now, my conclusion, uh, low-cost GIS can be used in developing countries to improve urban land use management, urban sprawl, land suitability, development control, and mapping. You can produce maps that can be shared by so many departments within the system, but also other people. You can also have launch, this can also create as a launching pad for better GIS infrastructure once these institutions have got resources, then they can acquire the full-fledged GIS software to move up in their systems. Uh, I would like to end here. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. You have even sa saved a bit of time, which I guess we'll don donate to the next speaker. Our last speaker in the panel today is Dr. Shi Chen, who comes from the ZTE company, who also doesn't need to be introduced. He is a dean of a smart city college and a chief architect of smart city planning. And I know that he works not only in China, but also in other countries. So, Dr. Chen, the floor is yours. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. And I will explain how to use top-level design of smart city to guide urban development and original uh, uh, integration based on our cases, um, based on uh, from Germany to China and uh, from Malaysia to Pakistan. Why we need the top-level design for smart city? First, we can see a group of figure areas, population, and GDP. We can find the biggest, the biggest seven cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, Hangzhou. We can find that Chinese people just use 0 0.07, 0.07 percentage of territory to take 6.5 population and contribute 17.5 percentage of Chinese GDP. Meanwhile, Chinese urban adjacent rate we have increased from 15.7.4 last year to 70% for the past for the following 10 years. And however, the biggest seven cities urban adjacent rate have reached 90%. It is it is like uh, it means like um, a predicted migration movement will be emerging uh, from first tier cities to the second tier cities and small towns. And a lot of cities have to be competing with each other by their environment. Uh, for business, living, governing, and the natural environment. How they attract uh, those people, I mean, to compete with each other. Set, firstly, they, did, they need to set down their targeted persons. They need to make their people be more smarter and attract more smart people to go to their cities. And how to attract those people? First, they need to re reconstruct the industrial chain and uh, conduct the industry and the city integration, improve governmental efficiency, and uh, make the city be more environmental friendly and how they make those people stay in their cities they can make encourage those people to be free to communicate with each other with the people or companies locally or globally and spur these people's ideas transfer those people's ideas to technology and the products we realized that we cannot just use ICT planning to tackle the smart city problems so we need a systematic method to include all relevant factors into consideration. So top-level design is the first step of smart city dev development, not just the communication technology, ICT, I mean IoT or IT uh, technology. How we implement top-level design? Firstly, we need to identify the, ur the key urban and regional challenges, like urban disease, transportation challenge or environmental challenge, and we need to offer more jobs. Without enough jobs, it will trigger unstable public security. And we need to use our ICT and traditional infrastructure to support our competitive advantage industry. Secondly, we need to use multiple planning integration, not just ICT planning. We need to create include industrial planning, environmental planning, and transportation planning together. Thirdly, we need to di di digitalize the city parts and offer one flexible framework to plan the city, to tackle the challenge of uncertainties of the technology advancement. Finally, we need to use smart city to expand the market scale and accelerate the globalization access, um, process. 
Well, I will, I will use some cases to explain my principles. First one, I, will do, I would like to use Beijing Subcenter case to explain how to identification of core challenge. This project, um, initially, um, central government would like to uh, start this project to relieve the pressure of natural resources and the population. But the first challenge is about how to set up a new economic and development mode. We suggested the government to install centers and AVR or AR alongside the canal. This canal constructed 1,000 years ago and visitors can use VR and AR to reflect the views historical views just like uh, that building it, it could be constructed 1000 years ago Tang Dynasty or Song Dynasty and your preference data will be combined with the mobility data or hydrological data and population data all of this will be all, all of this data will be um, collected to the urban operating center and the Provide, be provided to the uh, merchants for their accurate marketing and be provided to market uh, to uh, government for their urban planning, just uh, as our um, representative from Malawi uh, said. And those data will be used by SMEs to spur their um, businesses and use this way to create a supply driven economy instead of demand driven economy and create data physical instead of land physical. Second principle is planning, integration, and the third one is digitalization. This case is uh, in Germany between uh, the busy river, Rhine river, river, and the uh, busy uh, uh, flight for um, airport Frankfurt. And the three cities may fly, fly to change That's me how to develop the economy synergetically. We are using urban planning to research the site. We find that three cities are connected by traditional infrastructure. And from 14% to 16% population are commuting from their home to Frankfurt each day. And the industry in the city, cities are intersected. So we suggest the government to use data to connect the city, company, and home. Like, uh, this is the scenario. When you are driving to your home, you will res receive the message from home. Somebody will be visiting your home, and certain percentage parking, parking place uh, is available. And three hours later, you need to char charge your car. The fourth principle is flexible uh, planning. We need to use flexible planning framework to face the future uncertainties of the technology advancement. Uh, based on our research about the hotspots about the uh, smart city, we find that for the following three years, IoT, smart uh, big data, and cloud computation will be hotspots. So we are combining city parts in IoT and edge computation to create a city computation capacity in 19 city. And the final principle, seems like I'm too fast. No, and, you're okay. And the final principle in, um, in Europe, southeastern um, countries, southeastern Europe, um, superficial. I mean, first level, we need to tackle the challenge about in the endogenous challenge. How to create an innovation environment, like attract innovative people to go to those countries and spur those ideas, especially the local young men, and the establish supply-driven uh, growth model to create more jobs. But that's not the key. The key is to tackle the exogenous challenge, how to use smart city to integrate southeastern European countries, pillar industries just like agriculture, fishery, and tourism. To use this way to expand the market scale towards the oriental countries and use and link isolated systems just like clearance, because custom system and transportation systems to improve the governmental and the social operation efficiency. If we have other questions, we can discuss that later. I want to save some time for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, we had an extremely time-conscious panel because we have spent time on making sure that everyone sticks to the eight minutes allocated by the organizers. Why did we do that? We wanted to leave time for you to ask questions and get answers from this extremely rich panel from different backgrounds and very well representing the essence of this Congress. So what questions do we have? No, we don't have any questions. Oh, okay, no one asked any questions on the smart application. The floor is yours. Please ask the questions of any speaker or about their presentations or whatever issue uh, you may wish to discuss in the context. We have 12 minutes. Yes, please. 
someone help me with the microphone or would you expect me to run around? Hello? Hello? Uh, Please introduce yourself. Yes, Marco Berlinguer from uh, Università Autonoma di Barcelona. And I uh, would like to ask uh, to the <coughs> Chinese uh, delegates, let's say, if you think that there is some difference in the approach that you are developing in China compared with other cases, I'm especially looking at two aspects, I would say, that uh, maybe can, be, can mark a difference. One is that you have a tradition of uh, strong government and uh, so uh, in that sense uh, also a tradition of planning that still exists in, in your approach to development and technologies etc. So if that is something that you perceive as a difference compared with other uh, approaches and the second also is how you combine and how this is different in case the relationship between the role of the government and the planning, the responsibility of planning of the government and the market. How do, would you describe this role in, in case there is a difference? Hmm? Who wants to answer? Dr. Chen, Dr. Bo? Both of you, which order? Thank you very much for the question. You mentioned the the 给您进行一个回答我感觉从中国建设智慧城市或者叫咱们今天这个会议主题城乡区域一体啊去协调发展这个事情来讲呃一个很重要一点就是中国是政府和市场两个轮子来推动的两个手都要硬呃都很有力度
Um, and I would like to you, uh, explain um, the government is slower, not just in smart city, and uh, but a uh, global uh, economy development. So you, you will understand how, how government plays their role during the com uh, construction of a smart city. For long term, uh, for long term, uh, chi uh, China contrib contributes thirteen percent gross power as the most most important uh, global economic engine. Just as today's topic, uh, how to promote urban development and regional integration. After passing the loose turning point, labor shortage and the constant increase um, in wages, China and the global counterparts are co collaborating to find a new solid and sustainable development mode. I just actually I also use um, presented a mode in Beijing case. Here are just presented three solutions from Chinese toolbox. First is to transfer from um, demographic dividend to innovative engineer or te technician dividend. For the past 10 years, Chinese university system nurtured more than 16. Um, million undergraduates and uh, graduates. They will be the solid foundation to create a supply-driven economy instead of a demand-driven economy to help China to pass the middle, uh, middle income trap. Second is to accelerate the, the domestic urbanization in um, in 2013, I just mentioned the urbanization rate will be increased from 15.7.4 percent uh, to 7 percent. ICT or digital infrastructure will update traditional in, in industry and uh, correspondingly, new city, public or private uh, services um, uh, de uh, demands will be spurred by the uh, ICT construction. And uh, third is one better and one road initiative while integrating the single economy by smart city construction, not only all stakeholders expand the scale of the, scale of the market, uh, but also do we accelerate the global flow of log logistics, uh, people, uh, capital, and uh, information. Um, but um, all in all, the development philosophy of multi multilateralism will offer an inclusive growth mode to the people, alongside the one belt and one road to share the economic development results. It deepens the globalization process, and this is the source and the foundation of VJD smart city top level design. I, I, I hope I answer your question um, based on my another Chinese uh, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> you see, we are extremely well prepared to your questions. Any more questions? Okay, uh, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, but the interpreters won't hear you. Can someone pass the second microphone to... Yeah, I have. I, I also have a microphone on me. I don't have this problem. I can walk around the whole place talking. I mean. Okay, thank you. Han Buske from UN Habitat from the Global WAPS Alliance, Water Operators Partnerships. I have a question to Mr. Chanza, and I would be interested to know if you have collected data on water and sanitation services and access to those services, and if you have used those, those data to implement some planning of infrastructure. Thank you. You can use the other microphone here, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we, with those uh, low-cost satellite images and also the software, we have actually collected information on sanitation right from the sewer system network for the city. We did that. Of course, we had to transfer information from the analog format maps. These are like uh, old maps. Then you digitize them. Now, for in low-income areas where they have got communal water points, we actually use the GPS to collect that information as well into the system. However, because it's an ongoing exercise, we keep on doing it all the time, but we do use these tools to go across sanitation, even beyond into utility, utilities, will be social projects, road infrastructure, and other areas as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's risk one more question. We're out of time. I still have two minutes. Please give me a coherent message on the screen and on the paper. Okay, I'll conclude. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for joining us in this session. I want to thank the organizers for this fantastic panel with very great diversity of approaches, of situations, extremely well organized. Everyone just used their own time, but at the same time, they have managed to convey, I think, messages which are very important to us. 
I will not try to summarize each of the of the of the speeches, but the. I think that the most important concept mentioned was on how to enable sharing in very complex and concentrated situations, how the regional uh, metropolitan organizations can help multiplicity of their municipalities through gathering the data in the cloud and providing services which for 300 small municipalities would have been quite complicated. Uh, we heard also about how ICT services can help answer this complexity of integrating different themes in one city through bringing these different issues through technology. We also had a very encouraging insight saying that, well, not necessarily everything is so terribly advanced and so terribly expensive that even in a situation where the resources are a little bit scarce, you can find good ways using open source software that is available and build the capacity of the people. And then the problem does not come in technology. The problem actually com comes in turnover of the staff who, once they learn how to deal with this, run away from the civil service, of course, to the private sector. We have also heard, uh, I think that is, that is very important to note, about the competition of the cities. Well, yes, this is based on, on the example in China, and we are not, not surprised. But when you look at the numbers that 90% uh, of Chinese urbanization is now taken by seven, uh, by seven cities, and that there are 20 cities that will soon concentrate over 70% of Chinese population, we understand why the key issue in this is not the necessarily the technology. It is the struggle, it is the fight for talent and for right human resources of the highest quality to come to live in those cities and to benefit from the technological advances that are provided by those cities. Thank you very much. And I encourage you, now you know all the speakers by face, to speak to them in uh, the couloir of uh, the event. And I hope to see you in the next sessions where we can continue this dialogue. Thank you very much.